Good morning. Before I start, all kids I have to make an announcement. All kids and tweens, please meet outside the ballroom for the program that they have. So, and now it is a great honor to welcome Chief Justice Nariman, Pro Professor Kekashru Dinshaw Irani Memorial Lecture, sponsored by Fazana and Zagni. Recently retired from the Supreme Court of India, Justice Nariman was hailed as a lion of a judge. Justice Nariman, who became the apex court judge in 2014, disposed 13,565 cases, delivered historic verdicts, including declaration of privacy as fundamental rights, setting aside of the IT Act provision, empowering arrests, decriminalizing consensual gay sex, and permitting women of all ages to enter Kerala Sabramala Temple. Yes, indeed, that is an achievement. As a young lawyer at the age of 37, Justice Nariman was designated as a senior advocate at the Supreme Court of India. While appointing him, the rule had to be amended as the minimum age for being made a senior in the Supreme Court was 45. He held successively significant positions, including the Solicitor General of India. Justice Nariman obtained his LLM degree from Harvard Law School with his thesis on affirmative action. He was one of the four distinguished alumni worldwide to be selected by Harvard Alumni Association for an interview in December 2020. Justice Nariman is a compelling speaker and has delivered many lectures over the years. On April 15th of the year, this year, he launched a YouTube channel, Justice Nariman Official Channel. He showcases 48 full-length videos of his lectures on law, history, religion, music, spirituality, and other topics. Justice Nariman is an ordained priest, a novel. He is the author of three books, The Inner Faith, Choice and Modern Day Living in Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrianisms and Other Faiths, and Discordant Notes, The Voice of Dissent in the Court of Last Resort. Justice Nariman is passionate about Western music, is an avid reader of history, philosophy, literature, and science, and enjoys nature walks. At this time, please join me in giving a roaring welcome to our keynote speaker, the one and only Erva Justice Roynton Nariman. So he's coming up. Fellows Artostis, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. I am so happy to be here before you today. The 
very national anthem that was sung so beautifully today has a Parsi connection. Francis Scott Keyes composed it during the 1812 Anglo-American War on the HMS Minden. And the HMS Minden was a ship built by the Wadia master builders in Surat. I am honored to deliver this lecture in memory of Kekashru, who was a very, very dear friend. If one had to describe Kekashru, one would probably describe him as first being philosopher and then a great music lover and then everything else. But he didn't just teach philosophy, he practiced it. I recall visiting him long after I was here in 1981-82, when his dear wife Piroja was paralyzed. And I couldn't help remarking that it would be so difficult to look after her here without any help, the kind of help we have in India. And Kekashu very philosophically answered me and said, when she was able, she looked after me, I continue to be able and I will look after her. It was such a beautiful answer yeah, and so simple. There was obviously a great deal of philosophy packed into that answer over the years and which was disseminated by him. The theme of today's talk really begins in 1903 with the marriage of a businessman, one of the Tata family, R.D. Tata, no less than J.R.D. Tata's father. J.R.D. Tata, you will all know, is the only Parsi to have received the highest Indian civilian award, the Bharat Ratna. Now, his father was a widower of 40 plus who fell in love with somebody half his age and she happened to be a French lady. He wanted to marry her, so he brought her to India. And there were as many as 60 priests who attended her Navjot ceremony. It's important. It was done in a friend's house, R.D. Setna's house. And after she was Navjotit, there was a wedding the very evening. On that very evening, after which there was a furor as can be expected in the Parsi community, which existed in 1903. Now, because of that furor, the Parsi panchayat called the meeting of the entire community, as it were, at which meeting the community decided that in order to understand as to whether Suzanne Tata could be considered to be a member of the Parsi community, they would appoint a committee. The committee in turn appointed a subcommittee, and the subcommittee in turn appointed an expert committee. <laughs> now, the expert committee consisted of 11 high priests and scholars. Now, this is very interesting. Go back to 1903. The expert committee, after deliberation, opined nine against two that Zoroastrianism is a proselytizing religion. It believes in conversion. First very important thing it said. Then it said that if somebody who has neither a Parsi father nor Parsi mother wishes to become Zoroastrian in India, the doors are not closed on him or her. It's amazing. Go back to 1903. And in 1903, they said that if a committee set up by the community is satisfied that the person is bona fide wanting to become Zoroastrian, then watch him or her for a period of one year, probation of one year, see how they behave in that year. And after that year is over, if the person passes the test, you can navjot the person, but after a barishnu, which is a ceremony of nine nights of purification. And then such person can get admittance. 
Now, the expert committee report written by Jeevanji Modi, who was a prominent priest and, and uh, author, was tabled before the committee which appointed the expert committee. That committee, in turn, was evenly divided, so it went back to committee number one. And from committee number one, it went back to the Parsi Majlis. And the Parsi community thumpingly turned down the expert committee report and said, no, not only should your father be Parsi, but your mother should be Parsi as well. And as a result, the Parsi Panchayat then passed a resolution which said only persons of Parsi fathers and mothers can gain admittance into any, anything meant for Zoroastrians in India. This was followed by a corrigendum, which said, however, no, custom and usage somehow has allowed Parsi fathers and alien mothers, as they put it at that time, <laughs> their children to come in. And therefore, with the corrigendum, we will rest at this position in law. Now, R.D. Tata naturally went to court. And he went to court with six others. He happened to be plaintiff number six. He also dragged in Sir Ratan Tata, who was his cousin, who was plaintiff number four, but didn't make his wife a party. This is of some, some significance. And the five trustees of the Parsi Panchayat were made defendants. The suit was filed in 1906, and it concerned two things. We are concerned with only one of the two things. One, whether the trust was properly set up, were the trustees validly appointed, and two, who happens to be a Parsi Zoroastrian under our law. The written statement of that suit, which I fished out from the Bombay High Court records, actually speaks of another lady as well, a Rajput lady, who apparently was also Navjotin at about that time. She happened to be the mistress of some Parsi gentleman and had produced a number of children for him. So therefore, there were these two instances which the court was concerned with. And when the suit came to trial, in those days the suit came to trial pretty early, you had Sir Dinshah Davar, who was the first Parsi judge ever appointed to the Bombay High Court as the presiding judge, and Justice Frank Beeman as judge number two. Frank Beeman turned blind ultimately, and because of his blindness in 1928, the poor man dived into a swimming pool without water and met his end in Switzerland. Now, these two judges were therefore tasked with discovering as to whether the trustees were validly appointed and as to who is a Parsi or Estrian. The hearing went on for a mammoth amount of time in those days, for over two months. And judgment was then delivered in November 1908, two separate long rambling judgments by each of the judges. Put before the court were three interesting instances of conversion on Indian soil. Now, mind you, the court proceeded on the footing that Zoroastrianism is a religion which, which says that you must convert. Question was whether you can convert on Indian soil. So, what was put forward was first the case of some Hindu pandits. Now, this was very early. And at the time, we are told of Nairiya Sangdhawal. So, it's at least a thousand years old. These three pandits are mentioned in a, a text called the Dhup Nirang. And their names are given, interestingly enough. One is Bayo, one is Jesal, and one is Shobul. Now, these three pandits, we are told, from the Dhup Niran, were persons who took to the kind of fire worship we believe in and actually converted. So this was cited as instance number one. Dinsha Dava pooped this and said, very likely, contrary to the text before him, they were persons who helped us and therefore probably not converted. Frank Beeman didn't buy that argument and said, no, very probably they were converted. But anyway, that was so long back that let's try and come to some later instances. The second instance put forward was that of Emperor Akbar. Now, Emperor Akbar, as all of you know, 
was a remarkable human being. He had what was called an Ibadat Khana or a Council of World Religions. Can you imagine? A Council of World Religions in 1578 and 1579, where everybody from every you attended. We are told Sabians also attended. Sabians are people who came from Yemen. So there were Jews, there were Buddhists, there were all sorts. And Mayarji Rana, the chief priest from Nausari, attended and apparently made such a remarkable impression on Akbar that Akbar had a fire burning in his court after the sessions with Mayarji Rana. So the fire had to burn continuously. He then adopted our calendar so that between Akbar and Aurangzeb's reign, if you look at any significant event, it will say Ma Sarvandin Roj Bairam, for example. And most importantly, he had Jamsedji Nauro celebrated as Diwali is celebrated today in India. So that became the major festival of Mughal India. So Akbar, therefore, was said to have been invested with the Sadra and the Kasti by Maya Jirana. We are told this directly by the Portuguese priests who attended the ceremony and recorded by many historians, including Vincent Smith. The committee, I mean the, the majlis back in Nausari were in jubilation. The emperor ultimately has become Zoroaster. Now, this again, Dinshad Ava pooh by saying, how can we say that even though he wore a sadrana kasti, that he converted? Because we have no evidence of any Atash Bairams being built by him or any Dakhmas being built by him. That was the answer he gave. Beeman said, I am prepared to believe that Akbar did become a Zoroastrian. And the sufferer, of course, was Jivanji Modi, because he was very harsh on Jivanji Modi for having written a book on Akbar, having stated in the book that he was converted and then having tried to wriggle around in the witness box. But ultimately, the two judges differed on Akbar as they differed on the pundits. And the third instance was given of an 1882 Mazgaon converts, as they were called at that time. There are some 11 persons who were probably illegitimate children of Parsis with Dubrans. And uh, they were now jyoted between age 35 and 70. And several uh, prominent priests now jyoted them. Now, this was accepted by Dava, accepted by Biman, but, said Dava, the father was Parsi. So there's no problem. So whether Dubran, whether illegitimate or otherwise, so long as the father is Parsi, it's all right. And then finally, Davar went on to formulate what has become our law. Now let me at this juncture tell you that this formulation and the entire discussion on who is a Parsi Zoroastrian would be called obiter dicta in our legal language. Why? Because Davar decided that the suit itself was not maintainable, again, in legal language. It had to be dismissed at the threshold. Now, why did it have to be dismissed at the threshold? Because, according to him, Suzanne Tata was not made a plaintiff. And if she is not a plaintiff, she would not be bound with any judgment or decree that followed. So the entire suit, therefore, on this score went. How, you may ask, did he then have this massive dissertation on who is a Parsi or Esther. He explains it himself in his judgment, saying, oh, we spent so many weeks over it, months over it, and it would be a great travesty if I were not to put down all this remarkable work, work put before me. Anyway, that's no real answer in law. So what he tells us is really no part of a judgment and cannot be regarded as such. But to go back to the three categories he laid down, Incidentally, he picked up these three categories from the written statement by the Parsi Panchayat, exactly what they said. First, original descendants of those who came to India, that is, father and mother both had to be Parsi. Second, Irani Zoroastrians who come to India, whether temporarily or otherwise. And third is this Parsi father with alien mother. Now, the whole difficulty with this formulation is that you now attempt 
to bring in some something which is like race or ethnicity into a purely religious matter. He therefore divided a person into two, and he said that every person who wishes now to enter an agyari must ethnically or racially first be a Parsi, which you only see from the father's side, and he must be Navjotin. This leads to many complications. You can have a Parsi father down several generations with alien mothers down the line, and ultimately have something like one-tenth of a bloodline from your ethnic great-great-great-grandfather. You would be Navjotit, no problem, you'd be allowed, entr allowed entrance. But if you happen to have a mother who was Parsi, and you happen to have a father who was half Parsi, but the other way around, not through his father, but through his mother, and therefore in your bloodline you were three-quarter Parsi, out you went. So this was the first problem with this formulation, this so-called ethnic formulation. Then, of course, you have the other problem with Iranians, because nobody looks into the antecedent of the Iranian who has come here, temporarily or otherwise. And that was pointed out by the English judge. The Iranian could be a person who could have been, let us say, a Shia Muslim for the last 10 generations, who had converted in Iran, because that was permissible, and come here and gave, would gain entrance straight away, without, without more. Now, given these conundrums, our law, therefore, ultimately then resolved itself on the question that both judges asked. And they asked, put yourself in the place of the Parsi settlor of the trust. Now, that again is legal jargon. Who's a settlor of a trust? A person who dedicates a piece of land for, let us say, setting up of an agyari. So put yourself in that person's place in the 18th century. Speculative, purely. We don't know what that person would say. And when you put yourself in that person's place, decide whether Mrs. Suzanne Tata should or should not gain admittance. The English judge said, perhaps she should, but then for every one Akbar would gain, and she would liken to Akbar, you would have a hundred lower caste Hindus who would flood the Agyaris of Bombay. So the entire thing took a caste turn. And Bhiman, in fact, used the word caste and said, listen, we have actually become a caste in India. That is, we are now hard and fast. You are either born in it or you are not in it at all. And nobody else can enter it. So our law, therefore, became under the Davar Bhiman judgment that you had to first have a Parsi father with whichever mother before you could be Navjotin and before you could enter an Agyari. Suzanne Tata lost. If I were to put myself in the place of an 18th century settlor, the very question the judges asked themselves, I have not the slightest doubt that they'd have admitted Suzanne Tata. First and foremost, she was the wife of an extremely prominent Bombay businessman. Secondly, she was French. So, you didn't look at it with the jaundiced eye of a caste Hindu. You looked at it from the, in, in those days, from the eye of a person who would say, look, somebody who's French would be at least equal to us. And therefore, I, we don't see why such a person shouldn't gain admittance. But anyway, ultimately, the two of them decided that Mrs. Tata cannot gain admittance. Also, there had been a problem with the Rajput lady. Because had they said yes to Suzanne Tata and no to the Rajput lady, again, the law would be in a flux and there'd be no clarity. So therefore, the baby was thrown out with the bathwater. Both went out. Now, shortly after, by the way, nobody appealed to the Privy Council, which was the Supreme Court of those days for the colonies. The Privy Council tendered advice to his or her majesty. And therefore, no dissenting judgments were allowed in those days. You had only one judgment, 
which happened to be the opinion of His Majesty's Privy Council, who was advised accordingly, and then that judgment was therefore enforced. In fact, there's an interesting story told of an Indian Privy Councillor, M. R. Jaikar, who sat with the English law lords, and they all differed on a question of Hindu law. Jaikar was in the minority, and the two English judges decided a particular way. They gave Jaikar the judgment to write it their way. So that finally, he had to write a judgment he didn't believe in, which became the Privy Council judgment, which bound everybody. The next important judgment in our history is Saklat versus Bella. Now, this case, unlike the case, the Bombay case, originated in Rangoon. And it was really a tale of three brothers. You had the eldest, a man called Mervanji, Kawasji captain, his middle brother Shapurji, and the youngest brother Bamanji. Mervanji was the orthodox bastion of the community. And it was brother fighting brother in this case. Shapurji was the one who adopted this girl, Bella. And Bamanji was the advocate who was the bachelor boy of the three and who very likely was the actual father of Bella. Now, what the court was told was something very different. The court was told that Shapurji picked up Bella as a little baby in a hospital. The mother happened to be Parsi, which was a lie known to him. Her name was Rebecca Jones. She was a Goan lady. And since she was a Parsi, she requested him and said, look, I am, I am in dire straits, I'm going to die, and my husband's dead already. Just please bring up this child, and Shapurji obliged. The reality of it is that Bamanji probably produced Bella from Rebecca Jones, and then pushed off to England, and left his brother with the baby. And Shapurji then brought up Bella as a Parsi. Now, when she was around 14, question arose as to her Navjot. And the Rangu Nagyari had an orthodox priest, so Kekobad Dastur from Pune was summoned all the way to Rangoon, who did her Navjot. And then finally she, was, gave, she gained entrance into the Agyari. The moment she gained entrance into the Agyari, the eldest brother got into action. And the eldest brother filed the suit. This was now the other way around. And made Shapurji and Bella, the defendants. Why was it called Saklat? Because he filed it together with another gentleman called Saklat, which is why it's called Saklat versus Bella. And this suit went before the first court in Rangoon and then before an appeal court. The, the suit was decided against Bervanji so that Bella could have got admittance. But then they decided to go to the Privy Council, which they didn't do in the first case. And the Privy Council then went into the Davar Beeman judgment in detail and ultimately adopted what I may call the Davar formula. As a result of which, Bela, therefore, though Navjotin, could not gain entrance as a matter of right into the Agyari. But the Privy Council said two interesting things. One, that there is no desecration caused to the temple by Bella's entrance, because that is what was harped upon by the plaintiff. She is now jyotit, therefore no desecration, one important thing. And then they also said, and they left the door slightly ajar by saying, look, the trustees of a particular agari can make the distinction between property and the right to worship. So, if you do not wish to avail of property and you are merely gaining entrance in order to pray along with others, a trustee may in his discretion allow Bella. Now that would have meant at that point of time that Bella would gain admittance because the sole trustee of the Rangun Agyari was her actual father, Bamanji. <laughs> but then forestalling Bamanji, Mervanji saw to it that there were other trustees added so that Bella would not gain admittance. And this is how, unfortunately, the Bella case also ended. And how, unfortunately, therefore, our law, therefore, became an ethno-religious law instead of merely being a religious law. Another important thing, 
Dawar and Biman were shown an 1872 act. The act said and defined a Parsi as a person who professes the Zoroastrian religion and spoke of the Parsi religion. This was poo pooed by Justice Dava by saying the legislators don't know what they are talking about. There is nothing like a Parsi religion. There is only a Zoroastrian religion and therefore I don't accept that Parsi and Zoroastrian are interchangeable. Incidentally, long after in a case called Merwan versus Sarwar Irani in 1960, a single judge went into the evidence in great detail and there was evidence before Justice Davar as well that Parsi and Zoroastrian were interchangeably used. It was pointed out that in Iran, Muslims called Zoroastrians Parsis. Parsi ultimately was something like Prussia, the origin of the place from which you came, nothing more. And don't forget, when we came here so many thousand years ago, we didn't come to preserve our race, we came to preserve our religion. And Justice Beeman correctly pointed out that we are like the pilgrim fathers or the Jews. The pilgrim fathers ran away from England to preserve their Puritanism, which was their religion in 1620. And the Jews after 70 AD and Titus' Titus's destruction of their third temple, so to speak, went all over the world in order to preserve their religion. So the whole thing was looked at from the point of view of race when it should have been looked at from the point of view of religion because we came here only to preserve our religion. And finally, therefore, the law laid down till the constitution or the advent of the constitution was, so long as you have a Parsi father, you are in. If you don't have a Parsi father, you are out, which meant that girls who marry alien husbands, so to speak, are not allowed to bring up their children as Parsis or Estrian. In 1950, we have the Constitution of India, which comes in. The preamble speaks of many things, including liberty, equality, fraternity. Now, liberty is fleshed out into liberty of thought, belief, faith, worship. And this further finds its well, itself in the Fundamental Rights Chapter, Part 3 of our Constitution. And there is an extremely important article, Article 25, which goes something like this. It says, subject to public order, morality and health, and to the other provisions of this part, which means other fundamental rights and persons who wish to enforce those fundamental rights. Subject to these two things, all persons, please mark the word all, have the right equally, mark the word equally, to conscience first and the right freely, mark the word freely, to profess, practice, propagate religion. Now looked at from the point of view of the Parsi lady, she certainly falls within all persons as does, the, as does her child. What is she entitled? She is entitled equally, that is equal to her Parsi male. She is entitled equally to do what? <laughs> to freely, mark the word freely, free again from constraint, freely practice and propagate. Now one of the meanings of the word propagate is send down to her children. So. We have an article which specifically speaks of Parsi women who have this right to propagate their religion, which is their Zoroastrian religion, no matter who they are married to, in favor of their children. Now, again, constitutional pundits will put two things against me immediately. One. Article 25 operates only against the state and not private individuals. Easily answered. You have another article in the Constitution which is Article 13 and which says all laws in force which are contrary to the fundamental rights chapter now which has come into force 
shall be void and of no effect. And law and law in force are defined as including custom or usage. So straight away, if you have a custom or usage which recognizes only the Parsi male and not the Parsi female, out goes that law. So no problem, state action doctrine invoked, Davar, Beeman and the Privy Council have to go on this call. Even otherwise, Article 25 is couched in general language, like some of the other articles which have been construed by the Supreme Court as being articles which reach out, reach out to private individuals as well. Now, you have, for example, Article 17 which says, untouchability is now out of the window. And if anybody practices untouchability, he is liable to be, uh, in fact, he is liable to go to jail because there is an Offences Act now. So that reaches out directly to an individual. It's not the state, obviously, you can practice untouchability after the Constitution. It's only individuals. Likewise, Article 23, which speaks of begar, slavery, etc. Now, this equally is a declaratory article, which, as I told you, said all persons have this equal right freely to propagate. And therefore, this equal right is to propagate as against whom? As against those who bar their entry to an Agyari or bar their entry to an Akbar, for example. So, post our constitution, our law seems to be clear, but unfortunately there is no direct judgment as yet. Change can come in one of two ways. One is that the community itself demands it. Now, this happened in 1988, as a result of which there were changes made to our succession law, to our divorce law. And one other interesting thing, even the Parsi Marriage and Divorce Act of 1936, that is long after Dawa Biban, long after the Privy Council, spoke of the Parsi religion. Very interesting. And one of the grounds of divorce is that if the two of you are following the Parsi religion and one of you now gives it up, that's a ground to divorce the partner. So when we come back to legislation, the legislation route is not available in India because the, I don't think people in Bombay or even in the other places in India are ready to petition government to change our law so that women and their children can gain admittance. So the only way out then is for a constitution bench to authoritatively pronounce on Article 25, and I'm told one such matter is pending in the Supreme Court. One other interesting thing, the vision of the Gathas is very clear on this point, as was told to you by several speakers, including Keki. You have the extremely important lesser sermon, as I call it, and greater sermon in Yasnaha 30 and Yasnaha 45 of the Ustavaiti, firstly the Aunavaiti and then the Ustavaiti Gata. In Yasnaha 30 uh, verse 2, each person is told to choose for himself a right. The expression is Narem Narem Shvakshya Tanuya. That is, man for man, choose for yourself. This is fleshed out even better in the next chapter, which is Yasnaha 46. But before we come to 46, there's a very, very important verse, which I consider perhaps the most important verse in the entire Gathas, 45.8. Because that tells you that when the prophet actually saw God, with his mind's eye, he says, chasmaini vyadaresem, chasmo, with his mind's eye, man. What did God tell him? God told him, follow the path of Asha through good thought, good word, good deed. This is where we get the genesis of good thought, good word, good deed, is 45.8. And it is then that ultimately you seek company with the Almighty in Garo Deman. And Garo Deman again, are two words which are in common use. Gavanu, to sing, and Deman, domain. So the abode of song which is heaven, in which Aura Mazda resides. But in Yasnaha 46, 
You have a direct verse which speaks of women. 46.10. And this talks of Na and Gena. Gena is a woman. And says that whoever, whichever man or woman, is to follow the Zoroastrian path, that is the path of Asha, I, Zarathustra, will be there in order to ferry them across Chinvat Pul, as we know it. The expression used is Chinvato Perettu, which is the path of the separator. So, if your deeds are good, the path broadens. If your deeds are otherwise, down you go. And one other interesting verse immediately after. In 46.12, we are told that a man called Frayana, who is Turanian, is not Iranian, therefore Mongol, has followed this path and has been gained admittance into the faith and is one of the great followers of the faith. So to end this lecture on a positive and hopeful note, let us hope that the constitution bench of the Supreme Court looks at Zarathustra's vision, vision and the great transformative vision of the constitution of India as well. Thank you all very much. Sorry, I've come back like a bad penny. So, uh, this was a brilliant, fantastic, thought-provoking talk. Thank God we recorded it because there was so much of information there that I probably need to see it a few more times to process it. On behalf of the Congress, there is a small token of appreciation. The actual one is too big to give Justice Nariman to... On behalf of the Congress, there is a small token of appreciation. The actual one is too big for Justice Nariman to carry in his luggage back to India. So here is just a small thing. It will be delivered to him back home. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.